So one of the things Jung did was he, he deeply, deeply studied the substructures of thought. So for Jung, like, you know, we talked about Piaget a bit, and we said, for Piaget, you kind of built your brain from your body upward. Brilliant idea. It's so smart. But Jung, Jung has a lot of Piaget in him. It's, it's more implicit. But for Jung, not only was your the substructures of your thought biological, and so therefore based in your body, but your body was also cultural and historical. You know, so partly because you're, you're an evolved creature, and so God only knows what's in there. 3.5 billion years worth of weirdness that you can draw on, or that can, that can move you where it wants to move you. But also, you're being shaped by cultural dynamics all the time. And human beings in particular, like we're just watching each other like mad all the time to see what we're up to, what people think of us, how we should be behaving, are we being boring, are people attracted to us? It's like we're social right to the core. And, and that's another way that you can understand an archetype. It's like part of the archetype is that we are social to the core. So we're interested in other people. And more if you're extroverted and less if you're introverted. But it doesn't matter. By, by the standards of, say, solitary animals, we're so social, it's just unbelievable. And so that's built in. It's built in. What's built in is that you find that interesting. That's the archetype. The archetype is whatever it is that makes you find that interesting. It's beyond your control. Like if you're extroverted, you're interested in people. You didn't decide that. It decided it for you. The question is, what is it? Well, it's your brain... Your brain, your limbic system, whatever the hell that means. Like, we don't know what that means. You know, well, we have no idea how your brain produces consciousness. Like, I'm dead serious. We haven't got a clue. And what that indicates to me, since we've been hacking away at it for, say, 400 years, is that the way we think about consciousness is wrong. Because we're not getting anywhere. Like, we go a long ways with lots of things. We're not getting anywhere with consciousness. Okay, so back to the archetype. So, Because I, I can tell you how these things arise to some degree. So you're interested in other people, say. And so you're interested in them because they're unbelievably useful resources, right? Because they know things. They have resources that you want. Plus, you want even subtle things from them. You want their attention. You want to play with them. You know, you, There's all sorts of things that you need and want from other people. So these social interactions are incredibly valuable and informative. But the information is interesting because part of what... Every single person is constantly broadcasting to every other person is how to behave. So now, if you meet someone and, and let's say you find them interesting, well, I can tell you that the more ideal they are, assuming you're not too warped, the more ideal they are, the more you're going to be interested in them. Because that actually is what defines ideal. Like, as you become ideal, you could say that is also the same as becoming high status. As you become ideal, then you're interesting to people. So that's interesting because that, what that means is that you can read off people's interest to find out when you're deviating from the ideal. And they don't even know what the ideal is. The ideal is that to which their attention is inexorably drawn. And they're always telling you when you should fall short of the ideal. Always. It's being broadcast at you all the time. And then your imagination back there is to try and figure out just what is this ideal? You know, because your imagination is watching you in a Piagetian sense, noticing what you do, and then trying to figure out what that is. <coughs> so, you'll have fantasies about the ideal. That, that often happens in, in a romantic relationship, especially at the beginning of it. Because, you know, you, you project your idealization onto the person that you're romantically attracted to. That's the projection of an archetype. So Jung would say, the woman will project an animus onto the man. The animus is her conceptualization of what the ideal man is. It's unconscious because it's rooted in fantasy. And the man will be in concordance with that projection in some areas. That's, those are the areas where she likes him, by the way. And will be discordant in other areas. And that's the areas where she constantly dis disappoints him as the relationship develops. So the, re the projection is there in part to help the person understand who it is that they're dealing with, because when you meet someone, you have, to, you have to assume something about them. It's the same as projection. You have to assume something about them. And if you find them fascinating, which is what happens if you fall in love, maybe it's because they smell good or they're symmetrical or something, you immediately assume that, well, those things really matter. You immediately assume that they embody the ideal. It's an oversimplification. 
but the oversimplification has a basis. And the basis is, if it's interesting to me, it must be close to the ideal. Well, yeah, except the person that you're going out with, attracted to, is warped and bent and flawed and twisted in, you know, 300 ways, and you'll find that out soon enough, just as they will about you. And that often just blows the relationship into bits, because the person will say, well, she wasn't who I thought she was. It's like, well, who said, whoever said she was who you thought she was? It's like, where did you get the misapprehension that she was going to be who you thought she was? God, what do you know? You know, you're led, you're led around by your sense of smell and your ability to detect symmetry. It's like, that's, yeah, that's not very sophisticated. So those are, those are, so the anima and the animus are two primary Jungian archetypes. And they're very complex, but that kind of gets at the surface. Um, the ideal that I was describing, so people are broadcasting information to each other, which is, be ideal, be ideal, be ideal. Be, and it's like, be my ideal, obviously. But let's say, let's say if, if I took a thousand ideals and then averaged them or extracted out the common ideal, the ideal that was common to all of them, that would be a savior figure. That's what a savior figure is. And then now, now and then someone comes along who acts quite a bit like that. And poof, you've got yourself a religion. So do not be thinking that these images that people fall around, like, like you know, like... What? Bloodhounds on a trail. Do not be thinking that those things are like conscious cognitive constructs. Like conscious cognitive constructs, like Marxism. They last like 50 years and they kill 100 million people and then that's the end of that. A good religious system, man, that will keep a culture going for like 3,000 years. And even at the end of it, it doesn't disappear. We know that the story of Horus and Osiris, for example, drove Egypt like Catholicism drove Europe, for like 3,000 years. That's a long time. And then it turned into Christianity. So it's not like it disappeared. 